Hello, boys and girls. Are you all tucked in? You got your stuffed animal? Good, because it's story time. Yes, that's right. I am all set. And yes, I have a stuffed Ludo from Labyrinth. This is apparently vintage. I had no idea until I opened the package and I'm like, it smells like the 80s. This rubber? You don't get that smell anymore. Ah, it's so awesome. <coughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, point of today's video, yes, I'm sorry to run up here. The point of today's video is to revisit my childhood picture books. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, not just the picture books, but like the slightly more, the beginner readers, those two, I've got, <laughs> I have mentioned before, I kept a lot of my old books. I have quite a few, quite a few of my old picture books. This isn't even all of them. Once again, I have rediscovered a lot of these by reading them to my kids. Some of them I kept, actually a lot of them I kept. You can tell which ones, they're pretty ratty. Other ones popped into my head like, oh yeah, I remember that book. Why didn't I keep that? Or why did I never buy a copy? So I bought a copy so that I could read it to my kids. And again and again, and enjoy it. Tiki Tiki Timbo, retold by Arlene Moselle. This is um, supposedly an old Chinese folk tale, and I've never been sure of the accuracy of that. However, this has been around for a very long time. Some of you may have read it. It is great fun. It is great fun. This is the one about the um, supposedly in olden days China, it was common to give firstborn sons great big long names of importance, and um, the sons who came after got very short names or I, I don't know what the daughters got. Maybe they didn't get named at all. Um, so anyway, the point of the book is that the firstborn son has such a long name that when an accident happens and his little brother has to run for help, he can't get through saying his name long enough to get anybody to help his brother. Luckily, it all comes out right in the end. It's okay. Uh, it is a kid's book after all. Thank goodness. Um, but yes, it's great fun when you're reading it aloud to try and get through all that. Next book. Some of you may be familiar with the song The Erie Canal. I've got an old view and her name is Sail. I was grown up with that um, being sung to me, so it makes sense we would have, have it in book form. These are just beautiful pictures by Peter Spear, who did a lot of illustrations for kids' books. Um, obviously, this is my dog-eared copy from when I was a kid. Uh, I actually have a drawing by Peter Spear. Apparently, I do not remember this, I was too little, but apparently he came to our town doing a book signing, I think it was, and he drew a picture for me. And I still have it. He did not sign it. <laughs> so it's probably not worth a whole ton because I don't know, it, it looks like one of his drawings, but I don't know how you'd especially prove it. But still, it's a pretty special thing to have. And just the book is a special thing to have, I think. I love his drawings are so detailed. So look at this on the back. So much detail. And I can read this again and again and again, and I'll find something new every time. So it really is a treat for the grown-up reading it as well as the child. And it's really, I think that's what I'm going for with a lot of these books. The Caboose Who Got Loose by Bill Peet. This is another favorite from my childhood, definitely. This is an adorable story about Kitty the Caboose who wants nothing more than to be free of the train and to be out on her own. And she does eventually manage that. Bill Peet was a Disney animator briefly. I can't remember what he worked on. He also did a lot of kids' books. Um, it's listed on the back here. Chester the Worldly Pig, Fly Homer Fly. Uh, I haven't heard of any of the rest of these. Maybe you have. Um, but it has just wonderful illustrations. Um, he not only wrote the story, but being an animator who drew the pictures as well. Thy Friend Obadiah. I still love, 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 love this book. It, it was a Caldecott honor book, and I can see why the, um, the drawings are just beautiful. They're very evocative of the characters, the time and place. This takes place on Nantucket Island. Um, I've been there. I've been there. It's beautiful. Windy. Very beautiful, though. And uh, Obadiah is a Quaker boy who befriends a seagull. And it's, oh, it's so sweet. Oh, my gosh. 
my heart. Ooh, my heart every time. Every time I read it. Um, yeah, I love this ever since I was a kid. So nostalgia, but also just just a very sweet story. Where the wild things are, we can't do without that. This is not my copy. I got the second hand after I had kids and reread it and was like, this is really good. I know there's been people have discussed this. Um they discuss how bratty Max is and how he really doesn't learn a lesson. I'm not so sure of that because rereading this several times, um, just several times, he's a jerk. He gets sent to his room, he goes off into his imaginary land where he's the king and all that. Then he gets tired of his imaginary land. And he just wants to go home. He just wants to be with people who love him. He's calmed down. He's over this whole being angry thing. And he's like, you know what? I think I just would rather be a good kid. It's not there. It's like, it's between the lines. But he got his supper. People have discussed that as a reward for bad behavior. I think it's the sign of an understanding parent. It was like, he's going to calm down. He's going to be hungry. So his supper was waiting for him, and it was still hot. This book, tell me if you have read it, because I still absolutely love this book. I cannot even remember when we got it, because it's I've had it for that long. The Cat Who Wore a Pot on Her Head by Jan Sleeping, Sleeping? and Ann Sadler. Terrible at the names. This one is out of print. You cannot get it new. You cannot get a nice new copy. <laughs> um, you can find used copies, but it's venturing on the rare side. So my copy is well. <laughs> Look at that. But even if, it, well, even if I could replace it, I wouldn't. Um, just because I, it's loved. It's so loved. This is mine. This is mine, you know? Um, but yeah, even if I wanted to, I couldn't replace it. It's a shame because this is so much fun. Venda Molina is a cat who um, has a ton of brothers and sisters. There's noise, noise, noise in her house all the time. So one day she finds, um, she's digging around in her house looking for stuff to play with. She finds a pot and she puts it on her head. It covers her ears so she can't hear the noise. It's wonderful for her. She also can't hear anything anybody says to her. So whenever her mama tells her to go do something, she gets it all mixed up. And it's it's fun to listen to. I remember as a kid giggling my head off. My kids still giggle their head off listening to this. It's so much fun to read as an adult that I almost can't do it because I'm laughing so hard. Like I say, when it's fun for the kids and fun for the grown-ups, that's when you know you've got yourself a winner. A Child's Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson. I love this edition. It's got these beautiful illustrations by Gyo Fujikawa, oh, sorry, Gyo Fujikawa. And, well, I open right to the one that's a little bit racist, about foreign children. Again, remember this is from the perspective of a, a white American, or is it British? White British Victorian child who might not know that much about other cultures, so I can give some leeway there. At the same time, apparently this was Robert Louis Stevenson writing from his sick bed, so it's also kind of his perspective. I don't know. I don't know. Take it with a grain of salt. For the most part, <laughs> these are really wonderful, wonderful poems. It's got, how do you like to go up in a swing up in the air so blue? Oh, that's still one of my favorite poems. There's one about the man who goes riding by in the rain at night. And very evocative poems. Um, and I'm not much for poetry, but so again, maybe it's nostalgia working here, but this one just, it really, really does it for me, for the most part. On the subject of poems, I have a child's first book of poems with pictures by Cindy Zikaris as my best guess. They are just adorable pictures. Look at your little mouse. There's a whole ton of them like that. See? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at that cat's. Cats sleep anywhere, any table, any chair, top of piano, window ledge, etc., etc. <laughs> they're really cute, sweet poems about animals and such like, and the pictures are just wonderful. Again, 
loved it since I was a kid. It's a new market, but good shape for all that. Um, so again, not being much on poems, but I guess just the simple ones, simple rhymes work for me still. So it's still such a joy to read. We're still on the big books here. Tasha Tudor's bedtime book. Tasha Tudor was huge when I was a kid. Very popular author. Her drawings are just absolutely gorgeous. Here we are. Here's Snow White. And The Sorcerer's Apprentice. The Star Dipper. We've got some just beautiful pictures here. Beautiful illustrations. So there are a lot of fairy tales. There are a couple here that you might not have heard, like Shingabis. I've never heard that one um, in any other book, actually. Um, so even the familiar ones are just lovely. With They're short. They're one page each. And then there's an illustration on the other page. And there are even some that'll make you cry. Babes in the Woods is in here. And oh my gosh, whoever thought of that, that story just Mm, I might want to have some words with them because, like, why would you leave the kids out in the woods? You're the author. You you do something about that. Even though as an author, I know that sometimes thoughts are out of your hands. <laughs> but, yeah, that one, mm, hard to get through. But, yes, just, I love this book. These next two, I wouldn't say, are necessarily in the same vein because they're nonfiction. But again, I've just, I've loved them since I was a kid. I do not have the cover to this. I don't know what happened to it, but this is A Very Young Dancer. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. A Very Young Dancer by Jill Kremitz. Jill Kremitz did a series of photo essays. She put out a bunch of books like this that were very popular when I was a kid. Um, I can't remember any of the rest of them, but there was A Very Young This and A Very Young That. A Very Young Dancer was probably her most popular book. So there are just a bunch of photographs and it's the story of the New York City Ballet, um, directed by Balanchine in the 70s. It was their performance of the Nutcracker, and it was the one of the little girls, there are always two little girls picked, uh, to play Clara, or is it Marie in this version? I can't keep them straight. Um, and it's actually... <laughs> Actually, the little girl who got picked and was the subject of this, I looked her up ages ago, and she's got an interesting story. You might want to, I'm, I'm not going to tell it here, um, but you might want to look it up. Um, her name is Stephanie, and the, 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 um, the book title is A Very Young Dancer by Jill, Jill Crumman. So look that up, and uh, yes, the whole story is incredibly interesting. Also, interesting tidbit of info. There are not only two, two Claire's or Marie's, there are two princes, two Nutcracker princes, played by boys in this one. Um, the New York City Ballet did the movie version of the Nutcracker, which was basically their stage version just on film, and uh, Macaulay Culkin was the prince in that. Well, one of the advisors listed, I believe it was an advisor or an understudy listed, was Sean Savoy, and he played one of the princes, not Stephanie's prince, the other prince, but she mentioned his name. It's a very distinctive name. It's the same ballet company. I was, I remember seeing that in the credits like, oh, wow, he's still working with them, or was as of the early 90s. That was pretty interesting, I thought. You never know what you can learn. And the other one is discovering ballet. Yes, I was very much into ballet as a kid. I wanted to be a ballerina and all that stuff. Um, so this is a great book, perfect for all young readers who love ballet. And it really is. Um, we've got stuff about the ballet dancers, the creators of the companies. This is an overview of how dancing works. There's people who work behind the scenes of the company. There's what the stage might look like. It's just a very interesting overview and primer for people who want to learn more about ballet generally. We're moving right along here. Next I have Make Way for Ducklings by Robert McCloskey. I always want to say it like Robert McCloskey. It's just such a cute name. Anyway, um, we can't do without Robert McCloskey, can we? He was just, ah, these darling illustrations. And he was such a popular children's author. I believe he's also the one who wrote Blueberries for Sale, which I have around here somewhere and can't find. We'll just pretend I have it, you know, up, up in the corner or whatever. Blueberries for Sale. That is a great book. It's very, very simple. 
very simple. Much simpler when you read it again, like, oh, that's it? That's all that happens? There's her and her mom and there and there's mom and that's about it. But it's a very sweet little book, fun to read, and um, my youngest especially really enjoys that one. So anyway, Make Way for Ducklings is also very sweet. It's just about a mama duck and her baby ducks trying to cross the road. And that's basically it in Boston. Uh, he always has them in a certain location, and there's stuff that's evocative of that location. We visited Boston when I was a very little girl, and I barely remember any of it, but I remember the swan boats. <laughs> Can't forget those swan boats. This one, I highly doubt anybody else has read this one. Anybody who's watching, tell me if you have. This one is called Hawaii is a Rainbow. It's a very, 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 very simple book of colors, like the child's first book of colors. But they're all Hawaii-centric because the lady who wrote it lived in Hawaii, and so did the guy who did the photographs. It was published by University of Hawaii Press in Honolulu, and we lived there for a year. So that's how I got a hold of it, and that's how I got her signature in the book. So it's a pretty special thing. But yeah, just every few pages. Here we have yellow, 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 and green. So it's just a series of colors, but the pictures are just beautiful. I love looking at this book, just looking through it. It's basically all I can do. It's hardly any words, but I love looking through it. And on the back, we have the rainbow. The Train. Anybody read The Train by David McPhail? <laughs> it's a little crispy on the edges. Yes, 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 yes. It is taped within an inch of its little book life. Um, this is one of those stories about a boy who's super into trains. He loves his train set so much. He's playing with it, and his little brother breaks it. And the little boy, Matthew, is all set to fix it when his father tells him it's time for bed. So they tuck him into bed, they read him a book about trains, and then he dreams about his train. He dreams that it's huge and that he fixes it up and then he rides with the engineer. It's a very simple little adventure, but it can capture the imagination of the youths, you know? And that's basically it. It's him dreaming. <laughs> it, it doesn't even have uh, the train being fixed at the end or anything like that, for real. Spoiler alert. But... It's just a very sweet story about a boy who loves trains. George Washington's Breakfast. This one is just so much fun. It's by Jean Fritz, and it is about, there's some facts about George Washington. There's some history. There's a lot of facts about George Washington and a lot of history. This little boy is really really into George Washington. His name is George. He was named for George Washington. And for that reason, he wants to know everything he can about George Washington. And he practically does. Until one day, he's eating breakfast, and he thinks to himself, wait, what did George Washington eat, eat for breakfast? And everybody he asks cannot tell him the answer. So he goes on this quest, basically, to try to find out what George Washington ate for breakfast. He goes to the library, he does his research, it's pre-internet. <laughs> he goes to the library and does his research. The librarian looks up things and tries to help him. He goes to the museum with the George Washington statue that I just flipped to. Um, and he finally does find out the answer. I will not give it away. You're going to have to find the book and read it and find out for yourself. We're almost done here. A bargain for Francis. There, has been, there have been a lot of Francis books by Russell Hoven, pictures by Lillian Hoven. Francis is a badger. That's what she is. She's a badger. I blank for a second. Francis is a badger. And she apparently lives in badger land or something. I don't know. It's one of those animal books where animals are the protagonists, and that's just how it is. So she lives with her family, her little sister. In this one, I have actually barely read any of the other Francis's books, but this one was one of my constant companions. Frances has a favorite tea set. Her friend Thelma also has a tea set. And uh, something transpires about the tea set so that Frances sells her tea set. And they basically trade. And that's the bargain in question. But Frances didn't really want to trade. And Thelma kind of cheated her. So she figures out how to deal with that. So it's one of those nice, simple lesson learned. How do we get along with friends even when... Friends may not always be particularly friendly.
but of course they figure it out and they make it up in the end. So <laughs> it teaches you that you can do that. You can resolve conflicts. We are so close to the end, but I can't finish without Amelia Bedelia. These are the only two Amelia Bedelia books I've ever had. And now it's actually, it's actually harder to find the real Amelia Bedelia books because they're like ones that are pared down for easy readers and they're newer ones that are written by somebody else. I don't know. Um, but these are both by Peggy Parrish, the original author. Uh, Amelia Bedelia helps out is when she goes to help out an elderly lady with her niece Effie Lou. Effie Lou takes the orders that uh, the older lady gives them, Miss Emma, and uh, she goes the sensible route and says, well, doesn't she want this? But Amelia Bedelia explains that, oh, no, no, what she wants is this. Like, Miss Emma wants them to dust the bugs in her garden. Well, Amelia Bedelia goes out there with her feather duster and she dusts the bugs, as she does. This is the original Amelia Bedelia, the one with the, the light bulbs and the curtains and, of course, the lemon meringue pie. You can't go without the lemon meringue pie. The pictures are a little odd because they're, ma they're mainly black and white and green. I, I don't know who came up with that color scheme. I don't mind it, but again, I grew up with it, so I'm used to it. And let me know what you think. Last but certainly not least, and I, I have the fourth one, but I have no idea where it went, Frog and Toad. We absolutely cannot do without our friends Frog and Toad. They are friends and they're our friends at the same time. Oh, these story and pictures by Arnold Lobel. <laughs> but I still laugh at it. I still, I am. Toad standing on his head because he can't think of a story to tell Frog. So he's hoping that the ideas will come rushing down into his head. Uh, it's just so sweet. It's just so sweet without being saccharine. It's just, they are good friends. They help each other. Toad's perhaps not, he thinks differently than Frog, I should say. Toad thinks differently than Frog. And Frog's okay with that. And that is the sign of a very good friend. It's accepting one another's differences. And just being like, okay, that's how you are. I respect that. Let's get along and let's do something together. Let's have an adventure today. Their adventures are very small, very simple. But they're still enjoyable and they're still adventures. You can find adventures in anything all around you. And whew, that is it for now. I know it was a uh, more even than I thought. <laughs> so I'm um, no, sorry this took so long, but I just, you know, once I get into the books of my childhood, I just, it's going to take a while because uh, we didn't have a TV for a long time. So what else are you going to do? You read. Yeah, I read a lot. So, again, that's why I keep them. My books were my constant companions, and when something's your companion for so long, it's a lot harder to give it up. Anyway, now that we are done with story time, boys and girls and everyone else, it is time to tuck in, get your stuffy, snuggle up, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.